The idea of the benevolent British Empire is pure myth, from ruthlessly crushing rebellion to abetting the murders of indigenous people to allowing its colonial subjects to starve, the history of the empire is, to put it mildly, pretty messed up. Phyphothera and Festus, the mold that caused the Irish potato famine, ravaged the region's most utilized food crop from 1845 to 1852. As long as the potato held, they were very well nourished. They were dirt poor, but they were very well nourished. Around a million people died from the resulting disease and starvation. Millions more fled. While the British Empire wasn't directly responsible for the blight, imperial policies did little, if anything, to alleviate the sufferings of the Irish people. Such is the scale of the widespread hunger that even the crows have been reduced to skeletons. Even as the scourge swept through Ireland, appalling amounts of food and grain were still being shipped out to England. Further adding to the crisis was the way Irish society was set up at the time, courtesy of the British. The land-owning elite in Ireland were mainly Anglo-Irish landlords who managed their properties from afar. This led to a bureaucratic nightmare as countless people starved. At the helm of this petty British bureaucracy stood Sir Charles Trevelyan, the official in charge of government relief efforts in Ireland during the famine. Trevelyan seemed to believe the famine was a sort of divine punishment on the Irish people and, rooted in the power of free enterprise, did little to halt the mass starvation. His opinion was that it was up to the landlords to help the Irish, not the English government. His appointment was nothing more than a dagger to Irish hope. The mass killing of Australia's native Aboriginal people is one of the many dark chapters of the British Empire's scarlet history. After the British lost the American Revolution, its prisons were severely overcrowded, and the Empire no longer had the option of shipping convicts to their former colonies. They began a frantic search for another location that could house a significant portion of the British prison population. That began the imperial expansion into Australia, at the harrowing cost of the continent's native population. The first settlement was established in January 1788, with Captain Arthur Phillip helming a modest fleet transporting the initial batch of prisoners. Large-scale massacres of indigenous people began a few years later. By 1794, British troops carried out the first wave of mass killings before eventually relying on colonial settlers and regional police to do the job, often with governmental support. Such attacks on the aboriginal people continued with legal impunity until the 1920s. The 1838 Mile Creek Massacre, which saw the murder of at least 28 indigenous people, is one that stands out from the normal everyday massacres carried out. It is one of the few instances of British settlers being tried and found guilty for killing aboriginal people. They started shooting and using their bayonets on the kids and, and killing all the, the women. From 1794 to 1928, it's estimated that over 400 massacres occurred on the Australian colonial frontier. During this period, from these calculated and government-sponsored offensives alone, Aboriginal casualties numbered over 10,000. The British Empire implemented what some refer to as the first modern concentration camps, setting them up during the Second Boer War in South Africa. Boers were descendants of Dutch colonists, and the conflict, which lasted from 1899 to 1902, saw British troops enact drastic measures against Boer guerrilla movements. By 1900, Imperial forces relocated over 200,000 civilians into camps, most of whom were women and children. The horrid conditions of the camps, which included starvation and widespread disease, were famously described by English anti-war activist Emily Hobhouse, who wrote, There are nearly 2,000 people in this one camp, over 900 children. Imagine the heat outside the tents and the suffocation inside. The sun blazed through the single canvas, and the flies lay thick and black on everything. No chair, no table, nor any room for such. Some estimate that by the end of the war, as many as 28,000 Boers had died in the camps, with the majority of the casualties being children. While extensive records weren't kept regarding the deaths of black prisoners detained in the separate camps, it's believed that over 20,000 died. During the 19th century, the British Empire was involved in lucrative trade with China. Valuable Chinese goods such as porcelain, silk, and tea flowed into Britain. However, the Western power faced a pair of glaring issues when it came to their eastern trading partner. For starters, British vessels were restricted solely to Canton, which is modern-day Guangzhou, and Chinese merchants weren't interested in British goods. They demanded silver in return. This created a panic as Britain found itself constantly tapping into its silver reserves until they hit on a cynical solution. They began to smuggle Indian opium into China and sell it for silver, Opium had been banned in China since 1796. Decades later, opium addiction in the country reached alarming levels, to the point where British smugglers were bringing in over a thousand tons of the drug into China every year. In April 1919, the British Empire committed an atrocious act that would put India on the path to independence. 
The Jalian Wadabag Massacre, or the Amritsar Massacre as it's also known, occurred when a group of Indian nationalists gathered to protest taxation and conscription imposed on the Indian people. Also during this time, there was mass outrage toward the Rowlett Act, which gave imperial authorities the right to conduct trials without juries and imprison suspects without them first pleading their cases in court. Amid rising tensions in the Punjab region, British Brigadier General Reginald Dyer took command of the city of Amritsar. With martial law in effect, freedom of assembly was banned. However, on April 13, 1919, thousands traveled to the city for the Vaisakhi Festival, a traditional Sikh harvest celebration, and happened to join the demonstrators gathered at Jolly and Wallabog. But if we riot, if we fight back, we become the vandals and they become the law. This resulted in Dyer leading his troops to the park and surrounding it, where they then began firing on the unarmed crowd until over 1,600 rounds of ammunition had been spent. Afterward, official British sources maintained a death toll of 379. The number is likely higher, however, with hundreds more wounded. In 1943, while the nightmare of World War II engulfed the globe, one of the biggest famines in world history occurred in eastern India, taking the lives of over 3 million people. Unlike the Great Potato Famine in Ireland, the causes for the Bengal Famine in 1943 are considered to be more economic and political in nature, with wartime pressure seeing the British Empire divert massive amounts of food such as rice, which was like gold after the Japanese invaded Burma, to the front lines. Inflation, widespread panic, and general imperial indifference to the repeated warnings that the situation in Bengal could leave the region susceptible to famine paved the way to catastrophe. According to Leo Amory, the Secretary of State for India at the time, Winston Churchill was indifferent to the pending crisis, placing the blame on Indians for, quote, breeding like rabbits. Churchill was obsessed with his hatred for Indians, so much so that his right-wing conservative colleagues in cabinet were worried about the level of his racism. While attempts at relief efforts began at the end of 1943, the famine had already cost countless lives. For years, the tragedy was treated as a mere footnote in the history of World War II, but more recently, it's received more recognition. One survivor described the suffering, saying, Mothers didn't have any breast milk. Their bodies had become all bones, no flesh. Many children died at birth, their mothers too. Even those that were born healthy died young from hunger. Lots of women killed themselves at that time. In 1920, revolution broke out in Iraq. More than 100,000 Shia and Sunnis banded together against the British military, which had occupied Iraq since the end of World War I. While the British saw themselves as liberators who freed the Arabs from the yoke of the Ottoman Empire, the Iraqi people quickly grew dissatisfied with yet another imperial power controlling every facet of their society. Insurgency groups, which included Kurdish fighters, picked their targets wisely, railroad lines and isolated military posts. And the rebel forces displayed a fascinating level of class unity on top of their religious diversity. Iraqi revolutionaries seem to have come from all walks of life. From rural tribesmen to urbanites, it didn't matter. The British had managed to anger a majority of the population. The Empire used the uprising as an opportunity to showcase the terrifying power of the Royal Air Force. In 1920 alone, the RAF racked up over 4,000 hours of flight time in Iraq and dropped nearly 100 tons of bombs on the country. Iraqi casualties reached close to 9,000. For the next several years, control of the region would be held via a continuous wave of air raids, with RAF commanders specifically targeting villages. The British handling of the 1947 partition of India has to be considered one of the biggest and most grotesque geopolitical botches in modern history. In the aftermath of World War II, Great Britain seemed eager to begin walking the path of decolonization. This meant tackling the Hindu-Muslim divide during the rise of India and Pakistan's independence with stark indifference. The partition, led by a British lawyer who never set foot in India, drew up arbitrary territorial boundaries that separated families and carved through non-homogenous communities of Muslims and Hindus. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. In a 2017 interview with the Washington Post, a Sikh soldier in the British Army who fought in Iraq and later aided Muslims escaping to Pakistan described the mayhem that engulfed the subcontinent after the partition, saying, When I had left, India was a peaceful country. When I came back, it was bloodshed. Seemingly overnight, nearly 20 million people became migrants as they attempted to flee to either side of the new border, with blood trains, trains filled with slain passengers, becoming commonplace. Records indicate that 2 million people might have died in the upheaval that followed. From 1952 to 1960, Kenya was engaged in a bitter conflict known as the Mau Mau Rebellion. 
Primarily consisting of the Kikuyu people taking on a ruling British government, this is one of the ugliest moments of the 20th century. Both sides commit violent atrocities, but it's the colonial side that has often been ignored by historians. The Kenya Human Rights Commission maintains that 90,000 Kenyans were killed or tortured during the conflict, with another 160,000 jailed in hellish conditions. The works of Caroline Elkins, author of Imperial Reckoning, The Untold Story of Britain's Gulag in Kenya, and Legacy of Violence, A History of the British Empire, offer further insights on Great Britain's actions in Kenya by highlighting how the empire once again relied on camps to quell African resistance. If you did not call a settler Buana, you have committed the crime. In Imperial Reckoning, Elkins wrote, only by detaining nearly the entire Kikuyu population of 1.5 million people and physically and psychologically atomizing its men, women, and children could colonial authority be restored and the civilizing mission reinstated. The British might say they don't do torture, but we, the Mau Mau people, have gone through their torture. While British loyalist forces emerged victorious in the war, the brutal nature of the conflict helped pave the way for Kenyan independence in 1963. Allegations of wide-scale torture, forced relocation, imprisonment without trial, and a host of other flagrant human rights violations employed by imperial authorities have followed the British government into the present day. As the collapse of the British Empire neared, London officials looked to make sure certain dirty secrets remained forever under lock and key. Between the 1950s and 1970s, as control of its remaining colonies began to wane, the once mighty empire compiled a trove of sensitive documents highlighting the atrocities committed against colonial subjects across the globe. The scheme was dubbed Operation Legacy, a program hell-bent on locking down anything that could offer evidence against the British Empire and amplify the voices of the colonies it once ruled. Instructions were meticulous. The documents weren't burned or secretly sent back to England, they were dropped in the ocean. Operation Legacy was discovered in 2011 after four elderly Kenyans, who claimed to have been tortured by British forces during the Mau Mau Rebellion, were legally granted the right to seek compensation from the British government. I was castrated, humiliated, beaten, and I have no family of my own. I am very bitter, but happy that the High Court has accepted our case." Two years later, the government agreed to pay nearly 20 million pounds to over 5,000 Kenyan torture victims. Additional lawsuits alleging colonial land theft have followed, proving that the British Empire's ruthless policies are still being felt to this day.